Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Eric Nussler, Director of the Friedman Brain Institute, and it's a great pleasure for me to introduce you to this Diverse Brains or Diversity in Neuroscience event today, where we're welcoming Dr. Karina Davidson from Northwell Health. Uh, I, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, one of our own, Dr. Amy Kelly, who's a professor of geriatrics and, and palliative medicine, and also a senior associate dean for gender equity and research affairs, who will be introducing our guest speaker today. Thank you all for joining us. Amy, please take it away. Thank you so much, Eric. I, on behalf of my team in the Office of Gender Equity, uh, we are really excited to be co-sponsors of today's event with Dr. Davidson. Um, as many of you know, the Office of Gender Equity works to develop programs and support institutional structures and policies that um, help everyone have the uh, environment they need to thrive. And knowing that with us today, we have a um, group of leaders and mentors and scientists within our community, I wanted to take the opportunity uh, to show you um, a, a slide that has a little bit of information about our upcoming um, call for applications for our Distinguished Scholars Program. Uh, you will note here on the right, there's a QRL code. So um, please snap a photo of that uh, if you can, and um, otherwise look for information in your email about it. But we're looking forward to receiving applications from junior faculty um, who are working on uh, their research and have been waylaid by uh, caregiving responsibilities during the pandemic. So please take a look and get those applications into us by mid-January. Um, and with no further ado, I am so thrilled to uh, be able to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Dr. Karina Davison is the Senior Vice President of Research, Dean for Academic Affairs, and head of the new institute focused on health system science at the Feinstein Institutes for Medical Research at Northwell Health. She's also a professor of uh, behavioral medicine at the Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra University, and she earned her master's degree in inter industrial and organizational psychology and her PhD in clinical health psychology from the University of Waterloo in Canada. Dr. Davidson's extensive research focuses on innovations in personalized trials to manage chronic disease and patient symptoms that incorporate patient preferences and values. And her research portfolio also includes research in areas of psychological risk factors for cardiac events and mortality, behavioral mechanisms by which risk is conferred, and healthcare systems research to provide better healthcare. She's authored over 250 peer-reviewed articles, numerous editorials, book chapters, and has served on multiple scientific journal editorial boards. She's won numerous awards, both national and international, for her research accomplishments, as well as teaching and mentoring awards for her efforts to train the next generation of physician leaders. She served as, an, as the elected president of most of her professional organizations, and currently, She's the chair of the United States Preventative Services Task Force, where she's helping to evaluate a broad range of clinical preventative healthcare services. She's now applying experimental strategies to leadership development program evaluation, and that, that'll be the focus of her talk today. So uh, welcome, Dr. Davidson. Um, We're so happy to have you with us today, and we look forward to your talk and a lively discussion afterwards. I would just remind our audience members um, that please put your uh, questions into the Q&A slot as we go along. We'll save them up for uh, the end. And thank you all for joining us today. So thank you, Dr. Uh, Keller, for that uh, very helpful introduction. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen. And I'm looking forward to uh, an interesting conversation afterwards with both Dr. Kelly and Dr. Nessler as we sort of grapple with the issues uh, that arise from dealing with the structural gender inequities that we've had in academic healthcare centers for decades. Um, and we're all seeking creative and positive ways to influence change. Uh, to empower women to move to senior leadership. And that's really what I'm going to be talking about today. So uh, we are very grateful at Northwell Health to have received um, an NG, NIGMS grant uh, for short-term education training. And this institute is called MAVEN. It is to um, offer women, particularly 
women scientists from underrepresented backgrounds, senior scientist uh, leadership. And I'm really delighted to tell you today about um, the way we have structured this educational uh, experiment and the type of leadership training that they have requested and that we are sent, uh, providing them. So my disclosures for today, I have no financial interests. Uh, the views that I'm expressing uh, do not represent those of the USPSTF. My agenda for today's talk is to first tell you what our mission is, then our program design, the program framework, the training components that we have um, uh, built and designed uh, to launch women scientists into senior leadership positions, um, what the goals are of our first cohort, um, and uh, end with the leadership of this particular training institute. So our mission is to expand the national pool of qualified underrepresented candidates for senior scientist positions across all areas of science and to accelerate in particular their advancement to scientist leadership positions. Um, we were lucky enough to have a retreat at Cold Spring Harbor Labs uh, where we brought um, representatives, stakeholders and successful women scientist leaders from across the nation to talk about what our foundational values should be as we launch this training institute. And uh, here on the left, you see that um, we're committed to change, to opportunity, to innovation, and to equity. And uh, you will find this perhaps surprising, but the quantitative uh, criteria we have for evaluating the success of our institute, after quite a bit of discussion um, amongst um, all of our leaders, uh, stakeholders, and others who were committed to creating this institute, um, which includes quite um, fundamentally our training faculty, uh, was that our primary outcome is improving increased career satisfaction. So although you would think we'd be counting how many people moved into leadership titles or changed their title, um, the core of our foundational values really spoke to uh, what we thought we need in the next generation of women scientist leaders. And that are, that are uh, those whose careers feel engaging and vital to them who serve as role models for the future generations of scientists, whether they're trainees or assistant or associate professors, who can look up and see people who are uh, not just changing the culture of the scientific organization in which they're embedded, but who seem to be thriving and enjoying their career. That we thought was the sort of vital piece that we really wanted to hone in on as we crafted our training program in this experiment. We are secondarily um, measuring peak academic productivity, and I'll be showing you the metrics we have for uh, measuring that. And we've got network analyses of the colleagues with which they publish and uh, receive grants. And one of our secondary aims is to expand that scientific network. Um, then we are doing title ascension um, uh, uh, analyses to determine if they've moved up in the seniority of the titles that they hold. Um, and they are working on an institutional transformation project through this short term course to see if they can start affecting uh, the organization in which they're currently embedded in a positive way. So we did landscape analysis of the current uh, NIH funded um, and other national training programs. And I'm showing you here in yellow, those that are funded by NIGMS, in blue, those that are funded by the NIH Common Fund, and then those that are paid for uh, by a multitude of other institutes. And I want you to see how little programming we offer women at the very senior ranks, by which we mean people who are 10 to 15 years past their final training, uh, who have received tenure, um, and who are often, if not already a full professor, rapidly on their way to a full professor. It's those people who we saw um, in national career uh, engagement surveys, a dip particularly for women and minority scientists in their engagement 
and their uh, feelings that there was a future for them. Um, and that's also when all formal training programs disappear and there's simply an expectation that these people will now mentor all of the generations that are in all of these programs you see down here. So we targeted um, the MAVEN program uh, for this very specific slot in the landscape of um, training programs. So as I mentioned for our rationale, we thought it, it's um, the primary focus of all of our educational activities was to help senior scientists reflect on what will help them feel like they are thriving in their careers and in their future while staying in the science field. And that that is the best way to uh, success for changing the leadership landscape that we have across the nation. Um, we felt very strongly that if our leaders and role models are diverse, and as I said, engaged and satisfied and thriving in their careers, we stand to um, have a, a double hit. We'll both improve their individual careers, but we'll be showing all of their mentors um, a broader perspective in the ways that the research agenda can be prioritized, um, the way that diverse scientists can contribute. Uh, to the shaping of the mission and the focus of our future efforts. Um, and so we really wanted to focus on training to overcome this final transition barrier to attaining science leadership. Um, and that's uh, how we hope to positively impact um, the diversity of the pool of scientists who are available to contribute um, to the US. So, our program topics included negotiation, career planning, effective science thought leadership, respect-based leadership skills, interdisciplinary team collaboration and inclusivity, organizational culture problem solving, and evidence-based mentoring. And one of the underlying um, themes of each and every one of the modules that I'll be walking you through is that we used evidence or empirically supported educational materials. That is materials that themselves had been um, tested in a randomized control trial or in some kind of stepped wedge design to show that they actually improved the behaviors or the skills that they thought they were, um, uh, they were purported to be improving. So, we used a different recruitment strategy than is typical in um, many of the leadership institutes. Rather than this being by word of mouth or those who were socially connected or those who had very already had very effective mentors or career coaches who were in the know about latest cutting edge opportunities, um, we instead proactively through a foyer search found all women scientists who had one or more R01 equivalent um, NIGMS grants across the nation. Um, and then we um, made a denominator pool of everyone who was more than 10 to 15 years out uh, from their training um, and who met our other eligibility criteria. We then mailed them an invitation. So for the first cohort, we had 130 who were eligible. Um, we mailed uh, in, in bundles of 50, randomly drawn from that 130 um, letters out. We had 45 who confirmed interest and they were notified in the letter that this was an experiment and that they would be randomized if they indicated interest. And so 20 were randomized to the intervention and 20 to the control. We had two withdraw because of uh, logistical problems. They couldn't make the times um, that we offered and we started this during COVID. And we had two withdraw from the control. Um, so we ended up with 18 and 18. We had five in the wait list. We contacted our wait list and we uh, moved back up to 20 and 20. We'll be doing that cohort selection and that proactive recruitment um, four more times so that we have a total of five cohorts of 20 people in each arm. So we'll end up with 200 in each arm. As I mentioned, 
Our primary outcome is a sea change faculty survey. It's administered annually to all 40 and then 80 and then 120 people. There are 74 questions. It takes about 15 minutes and it allows us the extraordinary opportunity to benchmark the scores of our randomized groups, both control and intervention against similar phenotype scientists from medical schools across the country. Um, the scale has, the uh, survey has 12 scales and I show you here the kinds of things that they ask about. So we also have a fine tuned analysis of where we see differences between our two groups. And I just show you the design of the cohorts and the surveys at the bottom. So to measure our secondary outcome measures, um, we created what we're calling a blended major educational score index or a Macy. This is similar to what cardiology and other places do when they have multiple um, outcomes of interest. So we have a, a, a unweighted index score of someone's delta or change in their H index in their relative citation ratio in their annual number of publications and in their annual federal grant dollar amount. Uh, we take um, all of these measures at baseline before randomization, and then we calculate them from publicly available data once a year through the five years of this grant. Um, we're using N network analysis and N gram analyses to publicly um, calculate the size, network, and density of the colleagues with whom they publish with the expectation that we'll have um, higher density and higher number of nodes in those in the intervention group compared to those in the control. And finally, um, using natural language processing, we've validated a um, algorithm for detecting um, words that uh, demonstrate more command and control in the leadership titles of our um, scientists as they send in their CVs each year. So the program framework is that uh, we've engaged a number of very successful women scientists to lead as faculty um, and as mentors, many parts of our program. So it's role modeling. They're providing the knowledge and the evidence-based skills um, to uh, engage in the, in the skills that are needed for leadership, which quite frankly can be quite different than those that are needed to be a successful mid-level scientist. Um, we're doing a lot of analyses with each of our uh, intervention participants and then sending them out to practice their new skills as they create and build um, their IDP or individual development plan for the type of career they wish to have for the next 10 to 15 years. Um, you see a word cloud of the uh, program elements from the syllabi and the readings that uh, scientists are doing. And the structure of the program is to have one intensive five-day in-person first summer institute, then a year of mentorship, while they which includes both peer mentorship and meeting with people who are now heads of labs, heads of Ford Foundation, heads of um, you know, having senior science leadership across the country. While they work on their local institutional change pro uh, project, and for those who have identified gaps in their senior leadership that we didn't present in the first five days, they're also provided with the ability to do Harvard um, online courses. Um, and that's self-directed, someone who said, realizes they need to learn more about basic finances or about um, uh, HR has access to those courses. And then it's finished with a second summer institute, which again was originally conceived of as an intensive five-day workshop um, where they meet the next cohort so that we've started some social um, connections between the two cohorts. Because of COVID, we moved to virtual interactive workshops and run these on consecutive Fridays for seven Fridays, and we'll evaluate if we ever go back into in-person um, as we go through. Um, for the, the 
participants who were randomized to the intervention, um, they're going to meet all of these dates um, and they're going to have uh, covered quite a bit of content, which I'll show you on the next slide. So the first summer, uh, they learn um, leadership essentials, um, leadership lifeline and credo. Um, we deal with a lot of the specific issues that come up with being a leader uh, at intersectionality, um, particularly uh, what women leaders uh, have as issues that need to be negotiated and addressed. Um, and I'll, I won't read through all of this, but you'll see how many of these training components line up with those overall values and um, uh, the, the choices we made as to the leadership skills uh, that we should present them with. Here you see the Maven Institute II, our first second, uh, our first cohort will have, be having their second institute uh, upcoming very shortly uh, for this summer. And here I just show you the modules on the left and the specific topics that they'll be covering on the right. So for our mentoring, we have one-on-one -on -one mentoring, as I mentioned. Um, we did an in-depth analysis of the type of mentoring that each of the 20 um, senior scientists wanted. And then we had a national pool of willing volunteers and we matched. Um, this, as you can imagine, is not necessarily, and in fact, hasn't been in their area of science. This is more about their leadership their management of people, um, their ability to influence an organizational culture. Those are the kinds of skills that and mentoring that people sought opportunities for. Um, and then we had a coaching session um, from the evidence-based uh, uh, national research mentoring network um, for our mentors. For the mentoring pods, we uh, put like-minded um, senior scientists into similar groups as they tackled um, different things. We had some who wanted to become mentor, better mentors and those are group working together. Um, there are some who wanted to work on different content areas and so we've been grouping them according to their interests. Um, we're just showing you what some of our um, invitations looked like. We were concerned that uh, a piece of mail coming out of the blue, inviting people into um, this program would get lost as so many letters do. Uh, but we also sent notes to uh, each of the deans to let them know um, the value of this program, uh, which is estimated to be approximately $20,000 and that it was being offered because this was a woman scientist who was clearly highly contributing uh, to the science that's being implemented across our nation. Um, I'm now going to just tell you a little bit about our first cohort. So our participating senior scientists um, come from biophysics, biomedical technology, computational bio, biosciences, genetics and molecular, cellular and development bio, biology, pharmacology, physiology, and biological chemistry. This is the, the group that uh, were randomized into the intervention and they come as expected from right across the country, which of course is a, a great thing about going virtual. We asked them uh, what they were hoping to gain. And I'm just gonna show you a series of snapshots for the leadership and uh, training that they wanted to, to attain. And I'll let you read these. And then here's what they said in the areas of clarity on future and career planning. And I'll let you read these as well.
here's what they told us about um, gaps in training and time management. And finally, here's what uh, they told us they were looking for in supporting and learning from others and changing culture and lifting others. And here's what they said about networking and dissemination. I will tell you that at least in this first cohort, we've been surprised at how many of these senior scientists are either the only female scientist in their entire department or are one of two or three where the other two or one are very junior colleagues. So the isolation and the feeling for the need for peers, uh, even if it's outside of their institution is quite strong. This is our randomized control group. Uh, they've kindly agreed to provide their CVs um, and to fill out the faculty engagement survey for each of the next uh, four years uh, so that we can track their progress. So we've just launched our peer mentoring intervention. Um, Dr. Lynn Paget and Dr. Catherine Alfano run that. Uh, they ran informational interviewing um, and then reached out to nationally recognized leaders um, uh, in the, the fields, across all of the fields, uh, to find people who match those interests, which is, I think, how um, uh, Sa and I heard about this. Uh, and then we're already uh, sen sending invitations very shortly out to our next cohort, the second cohort. We also are very blessed to have an advisory board uh, that really is very engaged in helping us evaluate our progress, uh, think through what's happening politically and um, academically across the nation, um, where there are scientific opportunities that we can let our colleagues know about who are in our training institute, and they're listed here. I should say a note that um, Nancy Spector runs the ELAM program out of Drexel, uh, which looks to um, offer senior leadership training for those who are aspiring to a chair or a dean or a president or a provost position. And um, she's really helped us have a lot of information about what is needed in the leadership rung below that, which is really where we're targeting. Um, so she sees where there are gaps in training or gaps in experience or gaps in CV building um, that has formed a lot of the foundation of the training uh, that we are providing. We have a website in case you uh, have uh, interest in this. Um, we've got uh, information about the program. We've got frequently asked questions. We've got our leadership team up there. We've got the names of all of our teaching faculty uh, as well. Um, and so uh, if that's of interest to you and you want to know a little more details than I was able to provide in this short overview, um, you can see the website address there, www.maveninstitute.org. We've uh, been seeing traffic to our um, website increase. And what we're very pleased about is that the average session duration is two minutes or more. We're hoping to be putting all of our workshops and training modules up on our website towards the end of this grant. Uh, when we're just in the follow-up period, but we're not putting them up now because of potential contamination that our control participants could access them. But we're hoping to make this a public uh, resource, particularly when we can demonstrate uh, that it's evidence-based should we see in our randomized control trial. 
uh, that we've made differences. I do want to um, move towards the Q&A by thanking sincerely NIGMS for having the faith in letting us run this. Um, we applied to what was initially very clearly an RFA aimed at junior um, or training scientists. And we argued that if we didn't do something to help those senior scientists who inevitably are the mentors of those junior scientists, we weren't um, truly doing everything we could to empower this workforce to make the changes that it needs to see. Um, and, and both the reviewers and NIGMS agreed with us. Uh, so it took a bit of a leap on their part to get us to where we are. I'm joined um, in the leadership team by Betty Diamond, a renowned basic scientist who's had a passion and a commitment to empowering and raising up uh, women basic scientists for her entire career. And so her wisdom and guidance has been invaluable. And Dr. Jerry Kim, who works in business schools, first at Columbia and now at Rutgers, uh, for um, uh, seeking out all of the evidence-based leadership training uh, modules and the terrific teaching faculty uh, who can present that material and the applied experiential homework and tasks in a way that really engages um, the enrollee. So with that, I hope I've left enough time for some questions um, and I'd like to open it all up. I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much, Dr. Davidson. That was a fantastic presentation and um, very much of interest, certainly to me and I think to a lot of our audience. Uh, we have one question so far in the Q&A and I would encourage uh, folks who are watching to go ahead and enter their questions in that space as well. But I can get us started. Um, so Ashley Michelle Fowler uh, asked in the Q&A uh, about the intersectionality of identities, um, in particular beyond gender, that are factored into the curriculum and the recruitment. Um, she noticed, at least in the snapshot, that there is um, no one in the control group for Group A that that appeared dark skin on the um, on the slide. And I'm, I also am curious how you, how you might consider the variety of things from an inner intersectional perspective that you might be hoping to achieve with your sample? Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, we have uh, intersection, intersectionality is actually woven throughout the curriculum, but there are three specific training components uh, that deal with it directly. Um, there's uh, interesting evidence on the um, uh, leadership commands given when randomized to be um, informed is a male, white or not, a female, white or not, a, um, as well as um, uh, heterosexual or not. And in those vignettes that have been done in business schools, uh, they've then tried to change the message uh, in order to get to uh, decrease that inequity in people agreeing to follow the orders of their boss. Um, and so that evidence is presented at the very beginning of um, the uh, number of talks we have by someone who studies that area um, to help people um, both recognize the injustice, but also have actions um, that can mitigate uh, the resistance of those who um, may not follow the requests of their leader uh, when it is coming from someone who has who comes with multiple um, identities. The second piece we have that I think is really crucial is um, a four hour workshop on how to change uh, institutional and cultural practices that propagate or continue these inequities. Um, and there are studies of organizations that have tried, as you can imagine, various interventions, some of them with unintended consequences that led to worse prejudice and some which bettered it. And so um, in this four hour workshop, people are shown the principles of the interventions that worked 
and the principles of the interventions that were meant to work, but that actually worsened outcomes, particularly for people from inter, um, intersectional identities. Uh, and so we're, we're, that piece is mainly to arm people with information about the way to structure interventions as they're trying to improve um, their work environment for others. This, the, the one I told you about first is actually a reflection on people's way of requesting and commanding um, respect. Uh, and there's a lot of role playing in that. So they, we have a number of other cor course selections like that to help people think through what are the evidence-based ways um, in, from an organizational perspective, as well as a, leader, a personal leadership way um, to be changing the things we all know need to be uh, changed. Um, I see us, do you want me to read out the questions? And I see them. Yes, I know you can see them. So if you'd like to just, uh, you can go for it. Otherwise, uh, perhaps okay. Eric and I can tag team. <laughs> okay, Which, whichever you prefer. Go ahead, grab one from the list if you, if you like. Okay, um, so the second question was, can you give us an example of an evidence-based to tool you are employing, please? I'll tell you one of the ones that really has grabbed all of our passion and um, uh, 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 commitment, uh, both to the larger vision of what we're hoping to um, accomplish and to our day-to-day -day combat of things is there is a... Um, professor who offers an evidence-based tool. It's a very long and complicated exercise to create your personal work values. It's not a two minute reflection of, I think equity is important. I think respect is important. You really go through quite a, a complicated process to work out what are your top values? What do you care about most at work? for the long term for success. So for example, he has you think of when you've had a failure as a leader and to reflect on uh, what was wrong, not with your actions, but with the values that got enacted by the failure, because that points you to what inherently you think is valuable because you abrogated it in some way if you declared that as a, as a failure. He has you do that for, for successes. He, he gives you single cards that have values on them and you have to trade them with people. So you have to be starting to think about the hierarchical, which one is, if you can only have one, what's more important, this one or that one. And then he has you place them in a hierarchy. He has you print that card when you're done. I'm telling you of a very concrete tool. And whenever you come up with a leadership decision, that requires slow thinking, because we talk a lot about fast thinking and slow thinking. It's a complex, long-term executive function task that you need to reflect on carefully because you know that there's going to be harm as well as po the possible harm, as well as possible benefit. You take out your value card. And as you have written down the possible solutions that you can come up with for that complex problem, you rate each of those possible solutions for how close they are to optimizing your values. And it's been surprising how many people in just having that empirical gut check, I can do four things about this problematic employee, fire, counsel, move to someone else, you know, you stop and you go, what do I think is important to enact? And which of these four actions best enacts my values as articulated on my card in front of me? So that's one example. There are many, but I hope that gives a concrete feeling to you of the kinds of things um, that we get to do during this institute. Um, Thank you. I, think, I actually, I was hoping to guide you to, to one and, and tag sure. a little on to it. Um, there was a question from Michelle Lynn about what resources you would recommend for those who are interested in a similar program, but not eligible. And if I could combine that with a question about your plans for dissemination or sustainability of the program, should you achieve the desired outcome? Great. So 
Um, we're really, we've got professors from Stanford, from UCLA, from Columbia, um, from Rutgers. We've really cherry picked those people who teach primarily in executive business, um, but who teach the components that we think it's important for women senior scientists to learn. When we looked over regular executive business, either certificates or MBAs, as you can imagine, there's quite a few courses and components that although important for running a department or for running an organization, they may not be as honed to just what it is that women leaders need. Um, I think until we disseminate and sustain our program, um, looking at certificate programs or one day workshops for the areas that you know you need, uh, they are very available at almost all business schools. So they have two hour, they have all day, they have a five day intensive, they have certificate programs which offer you sort of a bundle of three courses or four courses aimed at a specific thing. So there's culturally responsible leadership um, that is three courses that is offered um, at, for example, the Columbia Business School for nonprofits. Um, so if you have some idea of what it is that what are the pieces that you want and you look through the business schools that are available to you either virtually or locally, um, I suspect you can find pieces of this training. I will also tell you that the Harvard online courses um, are either 15 minutes, two hours or five hours. So depending on, on uh, exactly how much depth you want in a certain area, perusing that catalog, they've got a very, very deep catalog of leadership, management, HR, legal, financial, uh, operating uh, modules uh, that are taken by a lot of CFOs, CMOs, CIOs, um, presidents, deans across the country. So I'd recommend that as a second. Now to Amy's question, tag on question about dissemination and sustainability. Um, first, we have to see if this is evidence-based. So we don't want to promulgate um, anything that actually doesn't improve things. So our very first test is to see if this actually works. If it does, I think probably posting the course material, important though that is for people who want to start to see what's available, that may not give the full enriched um, networking experiential program that we're offering. So we will probably move to a um, cost per tuition um, and then start offering this on a regular basis. But again, only if we see that it's actually accomplished um, uh, improving its the primary outcome. Thanks so much. I, I also wanted to add my uh, thanks for a very stimulating talk and a great program. We really look forward to seeing the results you get with, with Maven. Um, I wanted to remind people that the chat button is not functional. So to please ask your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom screen, please continue to, uh, to answer, uh, to, to, uh, to put your questions in Q&A. I have a question from Nihal Mohammed. Thank you, Dr. Davidson, for your excellent presentation. Does the intervention include any training focusing on addressing psychosocial barriers known to influence research success and leadership among women and minorities? such as self-efficacy beliefs, belonging, imposter syndrome, and things like that. If yes, could you please describe this training in more detail? Um, it only addresses those areas, Nihal, in an oblique way. And uh, I'll first tell you the reasoning why or the rational why, and then I'll tell you how we address them. Uh, we are targeting um, women who have usually two R01s who are 15 years out, who have been tenured and, and the majority of them are full professors. So uh, although these might have been issues for them or more prevalent uh, in earlier parts of their career, uh, they are not in our need survey what came up. However, 
Um, we send people for eight hours of public speaking training. Um, they have to give a five minute talk um, to donors and they practice that by video. Um, and then they get coaching on it and they get to see themselves on video and they try it multiple times. And then they do a 30 minute talk to a basic science foundation and they do that multiple times. And then they do a five minute on why they want the leadership uh, position uh, that they've decided they're interested in. So they have three different use cases. And so that may not deal with the intra-psychic issues of self-efficacy or um, uh, feeling like an imposter. Um, but if you believe some of the behavioral theories saying things assertively, surgently, with confidence, with ease, feeling comfortable in speaking when someone is challenging you, which is what happens during the speaker training, um, sometimes uh, we know empirically actually leads to improved self-efficacy um, and uh, uh, decreased imposter syndrome. Um, one of the fun things we do is that we're working with a group of nonprofit science foundations, and uh, they send their CEOs or presidents of their foundations to listen in uh, our Institute 2 to these pitches and actually give coaching feedback. What did they like about the talk? What didn't they like? What intrigued them? What do they remember? So that it's a practice rehearsal for starting to pitch in a more diverse way um, their science and their science thought leadership. Um, we will of course be interested to see if we end up with some of our women scientists ending up with foundation grants uh, because there may in fact be some networking that happens through this. Mm -hmm. um, but that's the kind of thing we're doing obliquely to work on, you need to pitch yourself you need to feel confident and sure and come across that way. And we'll give you both experts on the nonverbals, on the way you pitch yourself and content from the people who give away money, who will give you feedback on how you've asked, how you've made your pitch. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I have another question uh, that's come in from Emma Ben. Um, with a thanks for your lecture. And she asked if you could talk more about um, how the program or if the program addresses some of the systemic barriers that make it challenging for black or Latinx faculty to even reach the level of success that's needed to be eligible for the Maven Institute. Um, based on what's shared, it, it seems like it's more focused on the individual um, rather than the structural change, but one would need buy-in from leadership. Um, I, it's a great question, Emma, thank you. And we are once more addressing this, I will say in a, an oblique way, you. You may disagree with me about the obliqueness of it by the time I'm finished, but I'll let you judge that. Um, I am of the firm opinion that until we have visible black leaders, women leaders, Hispanic leaders, um, uh, people of different orientations who are in command and control positions, we will not make the kinds of aggressive improvements that we need. And so we are dedicated to placing people who are two rungs away from that up the next rung to get them to the final rung. So we're a feeder program to LAM, which, um, as, which informally people know, if uh, you want someone who's from a diverse background to be the next dean of your medical school, president of your university, provost of your college, um, they call LAM and ask for recommendations. So by placing people in power who can actually do something to change a culture and who are given the evidence-based skills to make organizational cultural changes because they've been taught what works and what doesn't, we plan to affect this. We're not focused, and the reason I called that oblique rather than, than direct, we're not focused on, on the many, many structural and systemic barriers that cause someone not to get to the senior scientist level in the first place, because we're looking to help them get to that final rung where they themselves, 
in our 200 persons that we send out are in positions where they can make affect the changes in the institutions in which they reside. Mm-hmm. And fantastic. And, you know, Karina, I should mention that Emma is the PI of an NIH first award that we just received at Mount Sinai. This is one oh, of congratulations. the efforts to hire groups of faculty yes. from underrepresented groups. Yeah, so we're really pleased and honored to have that grant with us. Yes. Um, here's a question from Urena Clark, who's a uh, faculty member in neurology here at Mount Sinai. Can you speak to the types of training provided in how to create systemic change? I can. Um, the kinds of things that people learn about, which again, I just find fascinating because all of us inside our areas of science often don't hear about the business sciences or the leadership sciences. We just don't. That's, that doesn't tend to be part of our network. Um, they did analysis of leaders leading change in organization, and they did a communication app analysis. Again, I'm just showing you one snippet of something that happens across four hours. So I'm giving you a two minute version of what people hear much more and much more depth. So apologies for the brevity. Um, There's a formula that leads to more uh, systemic change in communication by a leader. Uh, The formula is current distress plus future vision plus first steps has a better chance of overcoming or being greater than the resistance to change. And when they analyze leaders that are less successful, it is most typical that that leaders communicate two of those three things, not all three. So transactional leaders tend to tell you what's distressing now, why there's a failure, and then they tell you the third step what they're about to do about it. Visionary leaders tend to tell you the future vision. Sometimes that's all they do. We're gonna get to this place where things are better. Sometimes they tell you first steps, but they don't tell you current distress. And there is more empirical demonstration of organizational change when all three in that order are done. The current distress, is to activate people. And so you stay in that phase long enough to have visible upset by your members. You don't skate over it. Like, we don't like that there aren't enough biostatisticians, so let me tell you about the wonderful future. You really let people dwell in, what is it like when you can't get a colleague who's a biostatistician? How many grants have we forgone? How much disrespect and anger and frustration do we show to them? How much do we show to our other colleagues who get to them first? How many times has communication broken down because we're all fighting amongst ourselves for a scarce resource? What's the future gonna be like if we just continue this? How does that affect our organizational culture, our respect for each other, the way we treat um, other scientists? How does that make in-out groups because of our fighting over this scarce resource? I'm just again giving you a snippet. But you really let people dwell in if we keep on with our current state, how much distress is going to be caused? How many consequences of not acting are going to happen? And then you move to future vision. If you tend to be a transactional leader, you wanna skip over that. So I'm gonna make it better. No, you really dwell on that phase and you provide a visceral, clear, articulated, vision of what that future state could be. All of, the, all of the myriad ways that this complex vision could be felt by different stakeholders, um, by uh, outside the organization. And only when you start to see inspiration and everyone's living and experiencing that future vision that you ask them to join you in those first steps to get from that horrible place to that wonderful place. <laughs> that is empirically what is the best way as a leader to, to affect successful organizational change. Mm-hmm. I'm curious if you could share with us a little more about your own experience um, being a, a woman leader in science and how 
that experience has also informed the design of Maven. Thank you. I think that's a great question. Um, I've certainly watched the generation above me um, uh, who has um, experienced barriers and injustices, and I watched closely to try and learn when there was a best practice that I could incorporate, when there was a way I could help from below or sideways, as the case may be, um, and reflected a lot on uh, what are the ways that we can best remedy this situation. Um, so that's what I've spent my time doing. As a woman leader, I wanna make things better for others. That's my core value. And so committing to that, I realized, and what led me to Maven is I need people in positions of power. And one of the ways that business talks about the types of leadership positions that frankly women and those from underrepresented backgrounds are offered, those are called advisory leadership positions. That is, they have the ability to offer advice to the other types of leadership positions, which are called command and control. If you control the budget, if you control the persons, if you can hire and fire, if you can set a direction and you and nobody um, uh, has the ability within your domain, your command and control to, to uh, other than advise you, tell you that that's not what's going to happen. Um, that's called a command and control position. So I've watched as many very talented, very um, uh, high leadership potential women, both in medicine and in science, have been offered um, advisory leadership positions. And once you have an advisory leadership position, you tend to accelerate into other advisory leadership positions. It's, it's a phenotype of a career pathway. Uh, and that happened less frequently to people who might have the same leadership position, but happen to be men. And so I'm trying to move the successful women scientists who are in this program into command and control positions because that's where they have the best opportunity to make organizational uh, changes, um, to serve as a successful role model for those coming up so we don't lose the many, many talented scientists that we lose in the pipeline um, all across you know, all directions. Um, and we have mentors who can now enact and show those who come below them how to rise up uh, into these kinds of positions. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Davidson. Um, Eric, do you want to say thank you? I know you've got a pop. No, right I just off. wanted to say thank you as well. Yeah. I'm really delighted to be here and I'm excited to hear about all the wonderful things that are happening at Sinai. Well, and we are thrilled uh, to have you for this past hour, but also to have you engage with a small group of us in a second hour. And I think we can put that information into the chat to share as well, in case we have additional attendees um, who might want to, uh, I believe we have to switch Zoom links if that's right. Um, and if one of my yeah. colleagues wants yes. to we give it, have, okay, great. <laughs> Somebody knows what's going on. <laughs> yeah, we may have to send this out. Yeah, good. So the link Perfect. is on Q&A oh, chat, but it went to everybody. Yeah, good. Perfect. Perfect. So some of us will switch over there, but thank you so much, Dr. Davidson. And uh, we're just really excited about this work. Thanks for thank a great talk, Dr. Davidson. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Nessler. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Bye. Good.